um, is, this is it for me. And so that's why I'm so passionate about it being open, about the rules being transparent, <coughs> and about there being you know, equity in terms of treatment. Yes, I believe fundamentally it is the way, pathway forward for every single American, no matter what their ability. Commissioner Cox, a uh, fundamental human right? Or I have right used that term that I think it is a, uh, a civil right. Uh, and, and I think you can justify that pretty easily. This access to broadband as a, as a civil right, because you are not going to be able to fulfill yourself as an individual if you're a young person now, come of age, find a job. You don't get a job anymore by putting a resume in an envelope and mailing it out somewhere. The big Fortune 500 companies don't even look at that. They recruit online. If you're going to get yourself educated so that little kid out in rural America or in the inner city can do his homework uh, the same with the same facility that somebody that's got all these powerful tools of communication. If you're going to take care of your health in the era of telehealth, we can put the medical records up there so you can do that. If we're going to overcome any of these problems, if we're going to create any opportunity, you have to have that right. And it's, it's not, this is not a, a do-gooder statement. This has to do with the competitiveness of the country and different parts of the country. How do you bring rural America and the inner city up to the, uh, to the level of the, of, the, uh, of the big city? And then how do you get us in the broad get brand game uh, globally? We're 15th or 20th or, or something like that. That means these, these kids in other countries are growing up with all of these tools available to them, all these capabilities to do that. And if you think we've got outsourcing the jobs and hemorrhaging now, you maybe just see in the beginning of it if we don't get in the game. I want to uh, take a moment to ask you about something that uh, Commissioner Cops, you said in your remarks, because the uh, Twitter sphere and the internet are already exploding uh, over your uh, okay, comments what, about, what I say now? about licensing. <laughs> uh, and so I guess the question is, in terms of licensing to sort of restore some balance, how might that work? What would the exceptions be? And do you think that's really politically viable? I think it's, it's politically essential. And I think if uh, all of us, all of the folks in this room do our jobs, it becomes politically uh, viable. And I think. Uh, what we used to have was a set of 14 guidelines. I don't think we even need that many. And you don't have to necessarily meet every one, and you don't put on a little green eye shade and go through the station's license application. But what you do is you have an honest-to-God licensing system. So they would come in. It's the way it is now, every eight years, they send in a postcard, and they get licensed by return mail or without asking, answering to anything. So you'd have some guidelines. Uh, are, you, are you really going out and talking with members of your community? Are, are you making an effort to reflect the diversity, the great tapestry that exists uh, in your uh, community? Is you, are you running local programming and local music, or just all of this homogenized, nationalized stuff that sounds the same from coast to coast, and in which we lose the great uh, genius of America? And you just that license application comes in every three years, I would have it. And you, you, you make a judgment whether a station is really making an effort to, to serve the public interest and making progress. And uh, if not, I don't think you just grab the license and, and take it away, but I think you uh, uh, kind of point that out to them and maybe put them on uh, probation uh, for a year or two. And if they don't, as I said in my remarks, if they don't serve the public interest at that time, I believe the spectrum is you use it uh, or you lose it for the public interest. And there are plenty of other people out there that would like to have access to, uh, to a broadcast station and who would serve the public interest. And when I say this, but, but let me add, I'm not, I'm not here to indict uh, all broadcasters. I think there are a lot of uh, broadcasters, many of them smaller and independent, uh, who do a good job of serving the public interest. And it's, it's a damn sight harder for them to do it, though, in this world of consolidation and Wall Street rules all, and it's only the bottom line that uh, Counts. So we've got, we've got to get away from that and back toward the original bargain and the quid pro quo of this is a license to serve the public interest. Yes, you can make a, a good living by having that license, and nobody has any problem with that at all. But there has to be a visible commitment to serve the public interest. I want to remind everybody that uh, if you're following any of this online, we are taking your Twitter questions. The hashtag is NCMR11. And I believe we do have a, do we have a Twitter question. Yep. Can you hear me? Oh, great. Hi. Uh, yes, let's start with a question from Michelle in Los Angeles. Uh, she says, what advice would you, as FCC commissioner, and I guess this goes to both of you, uh, what advice would you give media reform activists about the best strategies to reduce the corporate stranglehold on information? Mm, good question. What 
I was listening to uh, uh, Commissioner Copps, um, I am always, a, a, I'm a hedger by nature. I, I, I always <laughs> think about um, if this doesn't work, then what next? And so one of the things that we that was talked about quite a few years ago, I think um, um, Mr. Ornstein and a number of other persons put forth, when we talk about, my thing is diversifying the space, having, you know, having more voices. And so what if we, and I'm not advocating this, what if we said forget about broadcasters and asking them for a public interest standard? I'm not, I'm just saying, what if we said to forget about it? And basically tax them, six, eight percent, whatever the percentage is, and create a, another ecosystem that would have more voices and, um, you know, independent voices and allow that to flourish from that standpoint. It, it's, it's, what if we do that? I guess my thing is, I'm not necessarily advocating one path over the other. I'm just saying we need to have a serious, significant, serious level of Here's the question that I can hear coming from critics who will say, well, that already, and this is not a position that I necessarily agree with, mm -hmm. but critics would say, well, you already have that in public broadcasting. I, I am a supporter of public broadcasting. Um, in terms of other, especially local voices that are viable, that are, that are disconnected from, say, state or federal influence to the degree in which some um, entities are, um, I, I think we need to have that conversation. I, I, I still think there is a need for a diversity in voice, the voices. There's an affordability crisis. How do we get there? And I think we need to have a series serious series of conversations about how to get there. And on the issue of diversity, it should be noted that there's never been a female chairman of the commission. Uh, there have only been uh, two women serving the most at any time. Right. Um, let's start with the Commissioner Copps. Um, is the FCC not paying a very good job to media issues related to women because of there hasn't been a lot of diversity in terms of the commissioners? And if, so, and if not, but how do you try to assure that that diversity is maintained? Well, it's one of our statutory mandates is to promote diversity, yet we live in a country that is over a third minority right now. People of color own, I think it's 6% or, no, it's less than that. Television, full power commercial television stations is 3.7% and of radio, it's like 6%. That is not reflecting the diversity of the country. We have got to make a commitment to follow through. We have a diversity committee. Uh, advisory committee at the FCC and they've given us over the course of the last few years I would say 70 or 75 different recommendations of things we can do to enhance the diversity of our media and uh, I have proposed that we take one of those uh, recommendations every month every time we have our monthly FCC meeting for the next year or two and uh, and act on it. Another question from the audience um, and I think um you could sort of explain what happens with sort of cable, because this is what the question gets at. I understand the fairness doctrine is not coming back, but why has the FCC sat by and allowed angry, hateful, often racist talk show hosts, 95% of whom are conservative, to poison the supposedly public airwaves? Oh, someone is promoting uh, that, uh, I heard a model. That is, um, this is when the personal side of Mignon and the professional side of Mignon is at constant war. Um, I, you know, we, we talk about um, freedoms that sometimes we take for granted in this country. And when we talk about those freedoms of expression, that sometimes means expression in which we don't agree with. Um, that's the hard reality. I, I don't expect you to embrace, you know, necessarily that. What I am asking you to embrace and raise your voices on is the, the pushing this agency and pushing the powers that be to help diversify the space. If you have more options, you have more opportunities to get more voices across and people have more, more venues and avenues and ways to go. The, the voices of good often get drowned out, but we cannot sit by and, uh, and, and just be satisfied with that. We have got to continue to do what we can to push this agency, to push our lawmakers, to push us to be creative thinkers in diversifying this space. And the numbers, if the numbers follow, the advertisers will follow, and the voices that we might have problems with become less popular, and we don't have to worry about that. The most powerful people in this room 
are the ones who have access to the, 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 these devices that control our airways. It's not the people sitting up on, on, this, uh, on this stage. If you speak with your clickers, then those voices will be gone. Before we, uh, we're getting close to the end here, um, Commissioner Copps, you had uh, quite a career. Um, will you make any news and declare that you, you want to seek another term? No, I will not okay. make that news. Well, you're not going to seek another term. So what, uh, in the time that you have left, what would you like to see the FCC accomplish? Well, that's right back to the issues we've been talking uh, about today. I'd like to see them make a down payment on media reform, and I won't go through that whole list again. Another thing I would like to see them do, and I have suggested this, is take up the issue of full disclosure on political advertisements on our media. You know, we all sit and watch uh, during campaign season these TV uh, ads, and it'll say, brought to you by citizens for spacious skies and amber waves of grain. <laughs> and you think, God, isn't that wonderful of them? And then you dig a little deeper and you find out it's a chemical company that's refusing to clean up a toxic dump. People need to know that. People are not able to make intelligent decisions about what they've just seen on the ad or what they're hearing in, in this attempt to, to buy But to be fair, elections. there is something of a revolving door between FCC. I mean, Michael Powell, he just took a top job as a lobbyist for the cable industry, which stands to make a fortune. Should there be some sort of law or requirement that prevents commissioners from leaving the FCC and then within a certain period of time being able to work for the other side? Uh, I think there are lots of agencies, and the FCC is one of them, where there is a, uh, where there is a revolving door. And uh, it's just not where America should be. Now, how you, how you prohibit that, I don't know. But I think you could say for X number of years, you, you can't do that. Now, Michael's been gone from the FCC for, for, uh, for quite a number of years. Uh, I don't know that anybody should be terribly surprised that he's ended up uh, uh, working with some of the big media companies, and I'm sure uh, you know he'll do good for them, and they'll do uh, uh, well for him, and, uh, uh, and and we'll see what happens. But it's it all goes back to just, and it's not just the FCC; it's just the corrupting influence of, of money in uh, Washington and in our politics right now. And it's been bad before; I don't think it's ever been uh, really worse than it is right now. And until we find a way to do that. And uh, we're going to be uh, we're going to be paying a heavy cost. My my, my well, office that, has been bright. Just, just, my, my office is. And I'm well, being, here's the thing. Okay. I want you if you can if you can react to what Commissioner Cop said, but also what have you learned other than the sort of corruption of Washington? What stands out in terms of uh, in, in the? Did I say that exactly? That's what I said. Okay, instead okay. of the uh, out of the two years. I get in trouble with the things that I say, so I don't want to make sure. Um, um, <laughs> in, in terms of um, I, a lot of affirmations or reaffirmations. Um, that public-private partnerships are the way to go. I see that when we, when we, in our communities with um, community reinvestment, with, with the IARRA, uh, I, I see that happening um, all over this country and I think it's a good thing. Um, I, I want us in terms of the challenges and the opportunities we have before us, I am not um, satisfied, nor is Commissioner Cops about our diversity initiatives. We need to do more in this space. When I say diversity, I mean in terms of um, racial, you know, ethnic diversities, um, in, in terms of uh, women um, diversity, geographic diversity. I don't hear enough Southern accents over the airways. I, you know, all of those things are significant, <laughs> reflective of America. So um, I, I think with that, and that revolving door, door, I wanted to come back to that. Sure. Often it revolves the other way. I'm the beneficiary of that revolving the other way. Uh, you know, my wireline advisor, who you would have met, but for a looming uh, crisis that we have in terms of Congress and not being able to travel right now. Um, um, I benefit every day from her merger experience on the outside. So that door, while, I'm not, it's, while it's significant in what you said, that can work the other way, and it's working to my advantage to better um, get a handle on some of these issues. Commissioner Clyburn, Commissioner Copps, thank you both so much for the questions. Thanks to all of you for your questions submitted online. Oh, oh. I've had an opportunity to talk with them away from the stage. They're very approachable, and I'm sure if you approach them nicely, they might answer some of your questions individually. Thanks, everybody. We appreciate it. All right. Thank you very much. That was thank terrific. You. Thank you.